Lovely. Well, perhaps I will um, start then with introductions. Um, I'm delighted to gather everyone to this webinar today. Um, I'm Sarah Abrabaya Stein. I am the Sadie and Ludwig Kahn Director of the Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies, and I hold the Viterbi Family Chair in Mediterranean Jewish Studies at UCLA, where I'm also a professor of history. And I am delighted to welcome you to a, today's webinar entitled New Approaches to Italian Fascism and Jewish Histories. Um, um, an event that I'm very grateful to have partnered with Marla Stone, one of our speakers today in conceptualizing um, to mark this important anniversary. Um, and I will be introducing the guests one at a time, but I first want to acknowledge that this event is part of the Viterbi Family Program in Mediterranean Jewish Studies at the Center for Jewish Studies and is co-sponsored by UCLA's Department of European Languages and Transcultural Studies and the UCLA Department of History. So thank you so much for joining us. And I want to thank especially our staff, especially Chelsea White and David Wu for their aplomb at pulling this event together. So in recognition that um, this year, um, well, last fall marked the 100th anniversary of the March on Rome by fascist uh, militia, um, an event that in time led Benito Mussolini to assume power in Italy. We determined to gather a collection of scholars together to speak about new approaches to Italian fascism and Jewish history. And we invited the guests I will shortly introduce to explore um, pressing questions for historians um, of the past and of course, citizens of the present, including the question of how explorations of Italian colonialism have pushed at the conceptual and temporal and geographic boundaries of, um, of the study of Italian fascism um, and Italian and Italian Jewish histories. And we also invented, invited those gathered here today to consider how fascism was experienced day to day um, by both Italians and Libyan Jews. Um, and of course, the inevitable question of how the boundary between the democratic and the anti-democratic has, has become blurred um, in the present moment. And it strikes me that among the commemorations of the 100th anniversary of the March on Rome in the fall, we saw both um, a number of erudite scholarly gatherings and also uh, fascist or neo-fascist um, uh, protests in Rome. So we are witnessing both sides of, um, of this anniversary. So I'm very pleased to invite um, our guests and I will introduce them here today and they will speak um, in the order in which I'm, I am introducing them and then we will return for conversation together and invite your questions. So it's my pleasure to welcome first Marla Stone, uh, the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of Humanities at the American Academy in Rome uh, from 21 to the present time and Professor of History at Occidental College, our, our colleague down the road. Her books include the, the Patron State, Culture and Politics in Fascist Italy and the Fascist Revolution, the edited collections Fascism in America, um, Fears Past, Totalitarian Art and Modernity, um, Alsta Democratis Tharb, The Legacy of Primo Levi, uh, and, and much more. Um, she, her, her work has appeared in many distinguished um, journals and she has been honored um, by, by many institutions as a, as a speaker and as a guest. And she's currently working on a book entitled The Enemy, The Politics and Propaganda of Italian Anti-Communism. Um, Professor Stone is the immediate past president uh, of the board of the ACLU um, of Southern California and the Society for Italian Historical Studies. Our second speaker will be Professor Shira Klein, whose work focuses on um, Italian Jewry, Jewish migration, and the Holocaust. Um, a professor at Chapman University, her, her book, An Italy's Jews from Emancipation to Fascism, was published in 2018 and a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award. And her ongoing research examines Italian Jews' participation in Italy's African empire from eight, the 1890s to World War II. Um, Dr. Klein is a scholar of the digital humanities and has overseen a Wikipedia editing by uh, nearly 150 students um, in, a, in an ambitious um, digital humanistic endeavor. Um, third, we will turn to Professor Guri Schwartz, an associate professor of contemporary history at the University of Genoa, co-editor of the e-journal Quest, um, and issues in, in Jew contemporary Jewish history and co-editor of the Rutledge series of the modern history of Italy. 
He is vice director of the Center of the History of Racism, Anti-Racism at the University of Genoa, and has held fellowships and visiting positions at many distinguished institutions, including UCLA, and we're delighted to welcome you back. Um, Professor Schwartz has edited six volumes and authored four books, um, including Emmanuel Artom, These Thoughts of Mine, uh, After Mussolini, Jewish Life and Jewish Memories in Post-Fascist Italy. I, I can't do justice to all of the scholarship represented here and much more. Um, our next speaker will be Professor Julia Albanese, Professor of Modern History at the University of Padua. She pursued her PhD um, at the UE in, in uh, Florence. Uh, her research focuses on fascism, political violence, and authoritarian cultures in the interwar year, and more recently, the memory of fascism. Um, she is the author of Dittatore Mediterranei, um, La, La Marcia su Roma, and has recently edited Rethinking the History of Italian Fascism um, and, and other volumes, and we welcome you. Um, last but not least, we invite a, um, a personal commentary by our friend um, and supporter, Andrew uh, Viterbi. Pr Dr. Andrew Viterbi is an American electrical engineer and businessman born to an Italian Jewish family in Bergamo, Italy, emigrated to the United States with his family before the Second World War, he has been um, a, a patron of the Levy Center, of academic institutions um, across California and the world, and remains um, an incredibly sensitive um, uh, and perceptive um, reader of the Italian Jewish past and of um, Italian Jews' experience of the Second World War. And we invite him as our concluding speaker to offer a personal reflection on the scholarly um, and um, familial developments that pertain to our topic today. So with that long introduction, I am delighted to turn the table or our virtual table first to my colleague, Marla Stone. And I thank you all for being here. Well, I would like to start by thanking Professor Sarah Stein and the Allen Levy Center for Jewish Studies at UCLA for thinking of today's event and putting it together. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be here. Last October marked the centennial of the March on Rome, the fascist seizure of power in Italy. And in addition to the anniversary sparking a general public conversation and general public concern about the state of democracy globally um, and about the continued appeal of fascism. Last year saw many conferences, panels, symposium on uh, Italian fascism, and it provided an opportunity, the anniversary provided an opportunity for scholars to take account of the evolution of the field and the current state of the field. Italian fascism has been the subject of intense study since the formation of the first fascist fighting squads in 1919 and interpretations of fascist ideology and practice, its governing style, its relationship to the Italian population, its techniques of coercion and consult, consent, its approach to culture and propaganda, the experience of marginalized groups, have occupied historians' attention as we try to make sense of an ideology and a practice that successfully convinced people to abandon democracy in favor of dictatorship, right? That's the core question, uh, you know, of the field. So in the last decade, the field has continued to change, to revise existing interpretations and to embrace new areas of research. And I wanna briefly point to three areas of study or historiographic development that have emerged in the last decade, decade plus. Uh, first, in contrast to the interest, to the focus on the regime's interest in building consent and support, uh, a historiographic trend that occupied many historians in the 1990s and the 2000s, myself included, there has been recently, more or less recently, uh, a renewed interest in the character and impact of the profound violence that brought the fascists to power and kept them there. And one of the first books to really draw us back to the centrality of fascist violence, particularly around the seizure of power, was our co-panelist Julia Albanese's book, La Marcia su Roma. Uh, and I'm sure Julia, Professor Albanese will say more about that, but it drew our attention back to the violence that preceded Mussolini's appointment as prime minister and that circulated right after that appointment. 
We've also had um, the book by Michael Ebner, Ordinary Violence in Mussolini's Italy, which went on to explore the place of violence after the regime came to power and the impact of everyday violence on people considered uh, at the social and political margins of the fascist regime. And then most recently, um, in conjunction with the centennial of the March on Rome, John Foote has published a book entitled Blood and Power, The Rise and Fall of Italian Fascism, which really uh, is quite a, I think, powerful and interesting book and, and quite readable, analyzes the impact of fascist violence from the bottom up, the experience of the victims and the communities uh, that were the that were experienced fascist violence. So that's one shift in the field. And then a second shift uh, that we also will hear more about uh, from, uh, from Sherrod Klein is the turn to colonialism. As a, we know, we've all known that it's a central, it was a central component of fascist rule and histories of fascist colonialism have certainly been written for a very long time, but there's a turn and in interest in the lived experience of those uh, subjected to fascist colonial occupation, which has been neglected until recently. Historians are now excavating the shape and character of fascist colonialism's profound and sustained uh, violence and atrocities, as well as the continuities between fascist empire and empire in the liberal, uh, in the liberal period. And here, for, you know, a couple of examples, uh, Ali Abdul Latif's Amida's Genocide in Libya, A Hidden Cultural Hi Colonial History, or Ian Campbell's Holy War, The Untold Story of Catholic Italy's Crusade Against the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And then a, a third turn uh, that I'd like to mention briefly has been the turn to the transnational or comparative in Italian fascist studies. It, there's a real interest in looking at how these regimes and movements drew from each other, uh, were inspired by each other, interacted with each other. Um, and so there's been a series of collections, you know, just for example, Arndt Bauer Camper and Gregor's Rosolinsky Libis, Transnational Connections and Cooperation Between Movements and Regimes in Europe, 1918 to 1914, or Sven Reckart's Camice Nere, Camice Brune, Milizie Fasciste in Italia e in Germania. Um, so with these historic, historiographic developments in mind, which I you know, have to say honestly have shaped my work, let me say a little bit about my current project on fascism and its enemies. Historians and the public at large are well aware of the role played by internal enemies, Jews and communists in the rise and consolidation of Nazism and of the fact that Nazis, Nazism's primary enemy was a racial political enemy, the Judeo-Bolshevik. Now, while the violent destruction of the socialist and then communist parties uh, during the fascist seizure of power and afterwards is more than well known, historians have not looked deeply, or I would argue sufficiently, at the central and defining role played by political enemies throughout the movement and regime phases. So my book project, The Enemy, The Politics and Propaganda of Anti-Communism in Italy, explores Italian fascist anti-communism and the multifaceted mobilization of fear and hatred toward an internal and then external enemy. So if in fascist Italy, the powder keg of violence against existential enemies did not explode into domestic genocide as it did in Nazi Germany, the fascist regime certainly gave enemies and purifying crusades a central place in its politics and mythology. Fascism defined the threat to social and national health and survival politically and ideologically with racial valences emerging in the late 1930s. So for much of the fascist era, 1922 to 1935, uh, from the seizure of power to the war in Ethiopia, the regime identified its enemy by characteristics drawn from the languages of nationalism and Catholicism, with the enemy being uh, barbaric, potentially demonic, foreign, and a threat to the Italian fascist way of life. 
Um, in the course of four phases between 1919 and 1945, the regime put a shape-shifting existential enemy at the core of its politics. So in the first phase, 1919 to 1922, that enemy was presented as anti-nation, the subversive responsible for the losses in World War I and for the chaos of the post-war period. During the next period, that of fascist state building, 1923 to 35, that victory over the internal enemy became the basis on which to build the nation and to sanctify the martyrs that allowed the fascists to come to power. And then in the wake of the foreign wars in Ethiopia, Spain, and on to World War II, uh, and when the embrace of race ideology, the communist enemy became a godless ideological foe to be defeated on the global stage and finally, during the Second World War, the Soviet communist enemy became a fully racialized other. And the argument went this other was genetically driven to destroy Italians at the level of the family and the church, which became the official explanation for why Italy had a fight in World War II. And I, I think I will conclude with that. I think I've used my time. Thanks. Thank you so much. We turn to Professor Shira Klein. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Good morning. It's great to be here. I also want to thank Sarah. Um, thank you so much for putting this together. I think it's um, I think it's really timely. And I think as Marla just described, there have been so many new works coming out recently that it's it just feels like um, the right time to to sort of reflect and to to think about uh, new directions that the field is going in. So so thank you and thanks everyone for being here. Um, so I wanted to um, spend a little bit of time on the new research that I'm doing. Um, and as Marla mentioned, I have been working on colonialism. And I got into this project um, when I saw in my first book on um, this really curious phenomenon that I found that um, Italian Jews were um, overall tended to be either accepting or um, even in some ways supportive of fascism. And it, it seemed to me like this really counterintuitive uh, finding. And I find that that's one of the things that also um, surprises people most when I speak to them about my work or my students, for instance, when they when they hear that, um, that Italian Jews had a degree of support for fascism, they go, wait, wait, what? And, um, and one of the, <clears throat> and I, I sort of explore this at length in my book and I won't get into that too deeply now, but one of the, aspects of uh, Italian Jewish support for fascism was um, fa fascist, fascist uh, uh, foreign policy, and in particular, fascist um, expansion into um, Africa, and this this whole um, sort of um, uh, uh, enthusiasm um, uh, about uh, getting Italy a place in the sun as, as the African colonies were known. So, <clears throat> So that, that sort of really um, uh, uh, whet my appetite and, and I wanted to know more about that. And then I started to look into how really Italian Jews approached colonialism. And, and I agree with Marla that this is, I think, a, a really exciting new field to be in. I think that Italian colonialism is, 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 is just starting now to be really intensely explored. And so I'm really excited to be a, a part of that. And I, I wanted to actually share maybe a few slides, if that's okay, Sarah, um, just to show some, um, some graphics and, and kind of what some of the things that I've found. So uh, by way of background, um, uh, Italy fought against the Ottoman Empire in 1911 and ended up capturing um, the three regions of uh, Fizantropolitania and Cyrenaica. And um, then it lost some of these areas during World War I, uh, but then regained them. And then afterwards, of course, expanded its empire into um, East Africa as well. And what I found was that Italian Jews fervently supported the colonization of Libya. So this is even before the rise of fascism. Some joined up to fight as soldiers in the invading armies. Um, so for in instance, this is an example um, of a Jewish soldier, this person over here um, on his way to Libya. Um, and others, others who didn't make it to Libya 
uh, recorded in the Jewish press how proud they were to, 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 to be part of a country that was expanding into Libya. And one of the first things that Italian Jews found um, was this very large uh, Libyan indigenous Jewish community. Um, and they lived mostly in these coastal areas of uh, Libya, um, a, a, a larger proportion in Tripoli and its surroundings and, uh, and a, a, a smaller proportion in, in Benghazi uh, and its surroundings. Um, but this was a, a large Jewish community, which already had ties with the peninsula from, uh, from before, long before fascism. Um, and the majority of Jews in these coastal towns worked in commerce and artisanry. Um, I managed to find um, uh, sort of lists of, of the things that, that, that they were doing um, in petty manufacture, in the service se sector. And the Mian Jews were mostly poor populations with, uh, with small pockets of wealth. Um, their leaders both uh, were both lay. These were wealthy and educated Jewish men with perfect Italian, with commercial ties to Italy, and uh, religious. These were usually um, either local rabbis or from Algeria or, or Tunis. And Italian Jews saw the empire as this golden opportunity to connect with Libyan Jews. Um, the Consortium of Italian Jewish Communities, which was uh, of this umbrella organization later replaced by the Union of Italian Jewish Communities, um, they represented Italian Jews in the kingdom, and and they they were just really thrilled um, at 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 this at this conquest. Um, and Italian Jewish leaders made the Jews of Libya a really high priority. And from 1925, so three years after the rise of fascism, to 1938, Italian Jewish leaders spent hours and hours every week writing to and about their brethren in the colonies. And I just um, took a screenshot of, of the files that I have just to show you like the sheer amount of, 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 of files in the archives that is going back and forth and back and forth between um, Jews in Rome and Jews in, in Tripoli and in, um, and in Benghazi. So we're talking about thousands of letters, meeting minutes, telegrams filling the archives. And what I found was that th throughout this correspondence was that from the very start of the colony, um, Italian Jews accepted and perpetuated the assumption that colonized subjects were somehow inferior. And I'm still trying to figure out if it was sort of racially inferior or if race is, plays a marginal part in here. But in any case, they mirrored the language used by the Italian state to describe North Africans. Um, and they spoke of the need to civilize Ital uh, Libyan Jews, to model them after the Jews of the peninsula, to elevate them from uh, their downtrodden existence. And this, this, um, this, this went on for years. Um, and all this was at the time uh, when uh, the Jews of Libya were, were, were really suffering. And I would say they were suffering twofold. So first they suffered as colonial subjects who were treated as subpar because of their legal status and who faced racism due to the color of their skin under Italian rule. And Italians carved out white only spaces um, in their colonies, which they packaged, as you can see in this, um, in this postcard, they packaged as attractions to Europeans. Um, and, um, and these sort of white only spaces, to, to, to give just one example, in the 1920s under fascism, uh, the colonial authorities forbade all indigenous subjects from attending the baths, uh, the cinemas of the metropolitans, from even from writing in public carriages, and Jews in the colonies were subject to these restrictions, just along with ev uh, uh, along with everyone else. Um, so, um, so uh, Italian Jews really accepted uh, the, these assumptions that there should be white only spaces, that there should be. Um, this very clear hierarchy between European um, Europeans and 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 non-Europeans, and what I found, and this is sort of very much in a nutshell, but what I found is that Italian Jews supported the empire to its very end, even after Italy embarked on a ruinous anti-Jewish campaign in 1938. Um, and it, it seems to me, and again, this this project is sort of in the making, and so I'm still still figuring this out. But it seemed to me that Italian Jews never realized the very strong ties that existed between imperialist and anti-Jewish ideology, um, and they never 
they never really realized the similarity between discriminatory colonial laws and anti-Jewish racial laws um, that, 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 uh, uh, that, that came into the scene in 38, 39. And I, I just wanted to, to, to end with, with some, some propaganda where um, you can see that anti-Semitic propaganda, especially visual propaganda, really wedded Jews to Africans in the Italian imagination. You can see over here, like uh, uh, Jews were presented by the, the large nose and Africans, right, grouped, lumped together as a threat to the, to the um, or over here, Jews represented by this figure and Africans um, uh, uh, threatening the, the sort of pure Italy. Um, and here again, some, some more images, um, or, or I think that th this one is really um, th this set of posters where um, both the African represented as a threat and, um, and the Jews represented as a, threat, as a threat to this sort of innocent Italy represented in one place as a woman and another as a baby. Um, so from 1938 until the fall of fascism in 1945, anti-Jewish and anti-African rhetoric converged. And we get image after image portraying Jews and dark-skinned individuals as twin threats to Italy's racial purity. So in a sort of twist of fate, um, Jews who had accepted the premise of superiority over um, uh, uh, people of, of African uh, uh, descent now found themselves the victims of that ideology. Um, so that is um, that is sort of my my research, and I was um, thinking about Sarah's questions to us and how um, this story kind of pushes at the boundaries of fascism. And my sense is that that it does. My sense is that colonialism and the, the whole story of empire really makes us. Um, push the, the, the chronological boundaries of some of the things that we really identify with fascism and that, that, that is empire, right? Because at least um, for Italian Jews and, and, and their story with, with, with their interactions with Libyan Jews, they predate the fascist period. And I think that they even continue to some extent after the racial laws and even after World War II. Um, uh, so there, there again, um, this this fascination with empire, the support with empire for empire. I, I see that um, I saw that recurring, particularly among Italian Jews in, in the United States, um, who after the war are still reflecting on the pain of losing um, the empire, which which sort of um, took place uh, uh, post World War II. Um, so those are my comments for today. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And we turn now to Professor Gori Schwartz. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Stein and uh, to uh, um, so all the organizers. Uh, I, I will pick up where uh, Shira Klein uh, left. Uh, when the peace treaties uh, were being drafted after World War II, uh, representatives of the World Jewish Congress met with representatives of the Union of Italian Jewish Communities and asked uh, uh, what they, what, if they had any specific requests in view of the preparation and drafting of the Italian peace treaty. And the only specific request they made uh, in that moment was that they said that it was very important to them uh, to stress that the colonies had to remain uh, under Italian control. Uh, now, th this may seem paradoxical, uh, but it is not. Um, first of all, for the Union of Italian Communities, the colonies mainly meant Libya, and uh, so influence uh, over, over the Libyan Jewish community. Uh, in a way, for them, it was protecting and uh, maintaining that, that relationship, with, which was made up of personal and family ties, cultural ties, economic ties, <clears throat> of course. Uh, at the same time, like all Italians uh, after the war and before the war, they did not feel that the empire was something bad, <laughs> that colonialism was something to be disapproved of. Um, uh, Professor Klein mentioned that uh, Italian uh, Jewish support for colonialism started with the, the, the war, um, the Italo-Libyan um, War of 1911. It actually starts even before that. Uh, we, we see 
various references to that in, since the beginning of Italian colonialism in the Horn of Africa in the 19th century. And we, I, I think we can say more. Italian Jews did not just support colonialism. They were actors who built Italian colonies as mm, military, uh, as engineers, as uh, um, uh, officers of various levels of the ministries, as professors in universities. Uh, they totally identified with the national narrative, um, which I must say is, is not at all surprising. Um, now, uh, shifting a little bit, but, but maybe not too much. Um, I find it fascinating the fact uh, uh, that, that we perceive um, this as, as a possible um, uh, uh, element of, of incoherence or, or something that challenges our understanding. I think maybe it would be interesting to methodologically not take for granted the end result. We, we know how things turned out. They didn't, uh, and it wasn't unavoidable uh, that things would turn out that way um, with, with the introduction of race, racial laws in, in, in Italy proper since 1938. Um, of course, we can identify, and it makes full sense, connections between colonial racism and anti-Semitic racism in, in, in the Italian peninsula. Uh, uh, at the same time, these connections are blurred, complex, nonlinear. Um, and, and I think we, we have to be, I mean, I think that this, this connection that we, that we make between what happened and what could have happened and what is the um, anti-Semitic policies and the colonial policies is, is extremely interesting. And it's interesting also in the way in which today public opinion uh, uses memory politics. Um, my, my current research in the last few years has been on uh, the history of anti-racism in, in post-war Italy. And one of the, I believe, most relevant uh, uh, cultural uh, mechanisms employed uh, to promote tolerance, acceptance of the other, and to fight forms of racism and, and xenophobia has been Holocaust memory, uh, with the assumption that that what happened should ha shouldn't happen ever, ever again, and um, that somehow exposing students to uh, the horrors of the Holocaust will promote uh, understanding, tolerance, empathy, and so on and so forth. And this is, of course, uh, extremely problematic. There is a lot of research that shows that it really doesn't work that way, and not 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 clearly and not immediately. Um, but I find I find this this very interesting, and I I want to point out one thing um, because because it the, the the multidirectional way in which the memory of colonialism and the memory of the Holocaust works um, in Italy and not just in Italy because it's it's a wider issue uh, of course, but uh, I will I will concentrate on the Italian case um, is is I think um, extremely stimulating. As you know, in the last decades, we have seen growing numbers of migrants crossing the Mediterranean to reach Europe. Uh, Italy, for its geographic location, is one of the places in which many of these uh, desperate people arrive. Uh, they, for the most part, don't want to uh, go to Italy. Italy is just, you know, on the route to to, to Northern Europe, to, to Germany, etc. And um, there, uh, unfortunately, many thousands have perished drowning in the Mediterranean. Now, uh, it's uh, at, at least uh, since the early 2000s that uh, when uh, major dramatic events with drown mass drownings of migrants happen off the Italian coasts, the press, public opinion, politicians, intellectuals frame that, uh, frame those kind of events with Holocaust analogies. Um, and they, they represent the migrants as the Jews of today. Um, and this is done 
Well, it, 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 for, for several reasons. One obvious reason is, is it reflects the, the, the importance and the relevance that Holocaust memory has acquired in, in present day discourse. Um, it is done on the assumption that this will shake consciences uh, if you, if you um, somehow connect it to something that is uh, almost universally considered uh, um, uh, a horrible moment in history. But it has its uh, it has a several several um, uh, I think negative or problematic uh, if uh, uh, unintended consequences. Uh, one is that if you represent migrants as the Jews of today, uh, you often tend not to see those migrants for who they are. Uh, nobody wonders who they are, what their histories are, uh, or nobody's probably exaggerated, but too often they're just victims. And as victims, they're stuck in, in, in this sector of our imagination where the Jew is, of course, one uh, key victim uh, in, in public discourse. Uh, at the same time, you misrepresent what the Jews are and what happened <laughs> during, during uh, the 30s and 40s. And finally, you tend to forget or uh, put to aside the, the legacy of Italian colonialism. I'll just make one example and then I'll conclude. Um, there was one major drowning in um, 2013 on October 3. It was for until that day, the worst episode. Uh, 368 people drowned uh, off the coast of Lampedusa, which is a small Italian island in the Mediterranean. And there was an uproar of, uh, it, it was a, a big media event uh, worldwide, uh, and Italian media framed it as another Holocaust. Uh, that, that was the way in which it was framed, which is very interesting. The interesting thing is that October 3 is the date of the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. And of those 368, 360 came from Eritrea, eight came from Ethiopia. So they were all coming from former Italian colonies. But somehow in public discourse, nobody made the, there, were, there was ample potential to frame that narrative in connection to colonial history and decolonization, uh, but nobody made that connection. The, the, the victims came from former Italian colonies. The, the date of the tragedy was the date of the Italian invasion of Ethiopia, and nobody noticed. Um, three years later, Parliament introduced a new law uh, making October 3 the day of remembrance of the victims of migration, um, built on the model of Holocaust Remembrance Day, exactly the same template. If you look at the law, it's uh, basically a cut and paste of the Holocaust Remembrance Day law, and they just change the date and, and the title. Um, and once again, even in the, in the parliamentary debate, nobody noticed that October 3 was the date of the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. Um, I, I believe there is, this is significant. It tells us a lot about how specifically Italian society still has to grapple with the legacy of colonialism. And, um, and it also tells us how uh, the, the the interaction between these memories is uh, uh, extremely complex and, and I would say problematic. And just one final note, the extent to which this kind of rhetoric has grown with migrants uh, compared to, to Jews uh, during the 30s and 40s, I think will, it is so strong that uh, because of the multidirectionality of this process, it's not just affecting the perception of migration. It's starting to affect the way in which people frame uh, the memory of the Holocaust. Um, in, in recent years, there uh, has been several uh, instances in which uh, in schools, uh, um, in which teachers with the best intentions, of course, uh, when they have to commemorate uh, the Holocaust for Holocaust Remembrance, they dedicate that time to talk about migrations and the tragedy of the migrants, which is, of course, something that, that we, we, we must uh, dedicate attention to, but it's interesting how the, the lines between these things are starting to get very, very blurred. Uh, and uh, the interaction between these narratives is uh, influencing the perception of both, both elements. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, Professor Giulia Albanese. Hi, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, I wish to thank uh, Professor Salastain and the Viterbi program and uh, the Levy Center for, for, for this invitation and for this webinar. Uh, there are many things I would like to address in this uh, very short talk. So I will try to, to stay short and, and go to the point. And uh, one of the things is the, this issue about uh, the, uh, how the memory of fascism, of uh, uh, Jews, Jewish history and colonial history is uh, framed uh, both in uh, historiography and uh, in Italian civil society, which is a theme that uh, Guri addressed, uh, Professor Schwarz addressed in a very interesting way, and uh, I think it should be uh, discussed more in detail. Um, and and uh, I wish to start from historiography, because I think that what we have uh, is a situation in which uh, since the 90s, uh, there was a, a huge uh, attention of historiography to both colonial and Jewish history. Uh, these uh, historiographies, in a way, uh, developed uh, in, a contemporary, in a contemporaneous way, but without being linked one to the other. Uh, and this is very interesting. Uh, and uh, uh, this interest came, I think, from different uh, 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 roots, uh, I would say. One was uh, uh, a new generation coming uh, 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 or addressing historical questions. Uh, the other one was uh, the influence also of other historiographies and foreign historiographies uh, on both colonial and Jewish history. And the third one, I think, was the uh, change in Italian uh, society, uh, which uh, uh, interrogated in a way uh, historians about uh, citizenship, about the role of immigration, and about racism. And these three aspects were fundamental in uh, forging uh, uh, questions by uh, uh, in, in, the, in the development of uh, new new questions by historians. Um, but they worked in a way in separated uh, in separate direction, and uh, they didn't uh, they weren't put into uh, dialogue until very recent time. And I think this is very a very interesting aspect. Um, uh, and in different way, all this uh, uh, all this thread uh, changed uh, the way in which we address the general issue of uh, Italian fascism and the history of Italian fascism. And they changed, in a way, the historiography on Italian uh, fascism uh, in different uh, uh, aspects. One is uh, the aspect of uh, the role of uh, propaganda in changing, uh, in a way, the Italian society as a whole, but also uh, uh, the role of propaganda and how this propaganda, in a way, uh, uh, transformed Italians and how this Permit, uh, permitted us to understand the uh, uh, acquiescence of Italians toward fascism and the way in which they got into fascism. Uh, the other aspect, uh, and I, I, I mean, we could you could discuss the, all of this uh, much more, but uh, I, I stick to a very very short uh, uh, phrase. Uh, another aspect was uh, mm, that. Uh, uh, Actually, uh, fascism and Italian fascism was not limited to the peninsula, the, or to the Italian peninsula. And uh, that's something that we learned from the historiography of Italian colonialism. And uh, uh, that in a way uh, permitted us to address as historians, but this is not uh, widely acknowledged in the general Italian society, uh, but uh, uh, permitted us to address the issue of uh, violence and the issue of racism inside the history of Italian fascism in a, in a very different way uh, with respect to with, uh, what we thought before, uh, before the development of the history of colonialism. Uh, and, uh, and, and, but this, this is a change which is ongoing, I would say, uh, uh, in, in the terms that uh, uh, I don't think that the general history of Italian fascism uh, are uh, or um, have managed to uh, address the, is the, the issue of uh, Italian fascism uh, in all its complexity and taking into account completely the uh, colonial and imperial aspect of Italian fascism. Uh, but what we learned, for example, from the study of propaganda is the, the uh, 
deepness of uh, of the um, uh, in a way of the uh, consciousness of uh, the uh, uh, understanding of Italians of the role of colonialism. What I meant is that uh, colonialism and the empire was a central discourse of Italian fascism, both in the colonies, but also in, in the peninsula. Uh, and that means that uh, the discourse of fascism was a discourse about empire and colonial and, co and colonies. Um, Another uh, uh, issue, and, and this is something that uh, it has, has been addressed more recently, is the ways in which uh, um, both colonial and, and Jewish history uh, uh, permitted uh, the awareness on, of, uh, Itali of historians of uh, fascism in Italy to uh, uh, address the issues of uh, Italianness and of citizenship. Uh, uh, because uh, in a way, both this historiography uh, permitted us to, in uh, to question in a, in a more general way uh, uh, how uh, Italian fascism changed uh, the boundaries, uh, I would say, of Italianness. And uh, uh, not just uh, since the, the 30s, but uh, already, uh, uh, I would say in the 20s. This doesn't mean obviously that uh, the Russian uh, laws were uh, unavoidable, but it means that uh, there, there, there are uh, deep roots that can explain uh, the development and the uh, uh, writing of the Russian laws in 38 and of the Russian laws for, for the colonies in the 30s. Uh, uh, and, and, and this, I mean, uh, change in a way deeply <laughs> the ways in which we conceptualize the role of uh, Italian fasc fascism in changing, uh, uh, I would say, uh, an Italian tradition, uh, in changing an idea of the country and of its uh, culture, uh, which has not been questioned uh, after uh, 45. Uh, many things of fascism have been questioned, but this is not the part of how we conceptualize the end of fascism. And that's that's one of the things that uh, probably, uh, uh, um, uh, in a way, uh, it makes part of a past which does not, uh, uh, which is not uh, passing in a way. Uh, how this, uh, and I think that this brings us to the present, uh, uh, because uh, in fact, what what we are seeing, it's obviously a phase of crisis of democracy uh, uh, in which uh, fascism and the word fascism come back in very different way in some in certain uh, in certain discourses it prevent us to understand completely what we are going through but in some cases it's also showing us uh, how much uh, images and uh, and uh, symbols and discourses coming from fascism can be uh, readdressed and uh, re, re uh, uh, can be reformulated uh, for a modern political discourse and and this is very uh, interesting but i think that uh, the most important reason for uh, in a way uh, uh, fascism continue to hunt us <laughs> i would say uh, is is the fact that um, uh, uh, as, as is demonstrated, for example, for the fact that uh, most of Italians uh, uh, did not address the issue of colonies after 45, et cetera. Uh, and also that uh, uh, there was uh, such a long period in order to acknowledge uh, the, the relevance also of uh, uh, the participation of the Italian uh, in the discrimination of Italian Jews and uh, in their deportation and uh, et cetera. Uh, I, I think that the, the central issue is uh, how we address the, uh, what an Italian is and how uh, how we, uh, uh, in a way, formulate an idea, an idea of what is an Italian and what is an Italian citizen. And I think that uh, this is something that uh, uh, that is a consequence of how we uh, dealt with fascism after 1945. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you so very much. Um, before I turn the floor one more time, I just want to acknowledge that Professor Sherrick Klein is going to teach at 10. So um, we thank you if you have to leave before we get to, to conversation. We thank you so much for your participation. But now we turn, turn to uh, Professor Emeritus from USC and former UCLA colleague, Andrew Viterbi. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I thought th this audience might be interested in the testimony of a uh, Jew who had lived under uh, the fascist racial laws, albeit for a short time and for uh, a very early part of his life. More than eight decades after the racial laws were imposed <clears throat> upon the Jews of Italy. I'm one of the dwindling number of Jews who lived in Italy when the fascist government enacted the laws revoking virtually all our civic rights. In 1938, approximately 40,000 Jews resided in Italy, constituting one-tenth of 1% 1 of the total population. Sometimes it's said one per thousand. Italians could be Jewish. Most, like my family, were descended from ancestors have, who had lived in Italy for many centuries. An additional small percentage consisted of refugees from countries which had already fallen under the Third Reich. My ancestors had lived in the city of Mantua in Northern Italy for at least three centuries and previously in Viterbo, near Rome, the source of our surname. In the fall of 1938, regardless of our status, all our lives were severely impacted by the newly imposed anti-Semitic legislation known as the racial laws. In my case, as a three-year-old toddler, this had no immediate effect. But in time, I would find that doors to all schooling from kindergarten to university would be closed to Jewish students, lest they infect the purity of the schools meant only for Italians. Much worse was in store for my father, whose three decade medical career, rising to chief ophthalmologist of the principal hospital in the Northern city of Bergamo came to an end just as did the livelihoods of most of the Jewish wage owners of the peninsula. Two years later, as Italy joined Germany and Japan to, to form the Axis intending to dominate all of Europe and Asia, the Italian government declared Jews to be enemies of the state. My parents were among the earliest to seek refuge from the conditions which had been imposed as a bitter insult to the tiny percentage of Jewish Italians who had done so much to create a nation out of a collection of feudal city-states and who had loyally served their country through a world war. Turned down for immigration visas by US consulates in Italy, my father managed to secure them for our family in Switzerland through help from a renowned colleague who had connections in the US consulate in Zurich. We landed in New York City on August 27, 1939, three days before Germany invaded Poland and started World War II. As I grew up, this country offered me unlimited opportunities, which only America could provide to the fortunate few who were grudgingly admitted among the multitudes of re refuge seekers. And modestly, I can say that in the subsequent decades, I was able to make full use of those opportunities. Not so much so for my father and many of the professional colleagues of his generation. To begin with, he and they had to pass the medical licensing exams 35 years after his medical school studies. Exams taken together with the new graduates 
half his age. Then approaching 60 years of age, he had to start a new medical practice in a new land with a language that he struggled to learn. Fortunately for me, he chose to obtain that license and proceed to practice in Boston, a city of outstanding educational resources, which I was able to fully benefit from without burdening my parents' meager resources. Hence, the racial, the racial laws, which had so cruelly diminished the quality of my parents' lives, for me instead, provided unexpected benefits. These benefits, however, would have been lost had my parents chosen to return to Italy after the war when I had barely completed elementary school. Hence, my benefits came from my parents' willingness to sacrifice themselves so I could thrive. Inspired by the books of Guli Schwartz and the Shira Klein, the letter specifically on the Jewish Italian refugees in the US, I'll conclude with my take on the continued attachment to the fatherland of most Italians and Italian Jews who had settled in the United States. As a young child during the war, I had none of it, striving only to become fully accepted as an American while viewing Italy as the enemy. With time, as an only child in the home of parents steeped in Italian culture and nostalgia for their origins, I gradually relented even to the point of absorbing the post-war myth of the good Italian. Even more, my parents' tutelage preserved and enhanced my knowledge of the language and culture. This allowed me to easily reconnect with relatives and Italian friends of the family and with colleagues, which softened my hostile attitude. Visiting my former homeland only twice in my teens and twenties, I later greatly increased the numbers and durations of visits, reaching almost an annual rate. Besides tourism and family, I was received by several universities and lectured at engineering schools in Milan and Turin. Surprisingly, I received almost as much recognition in Italy in the form of medals, honorary doctorates, and even civic and presidential awards as I did in the States, all of which did not fully erase my indignation over the suffering of my forebears due to the anti-Semitic fascist racial laws. Finally, I will conclude by saying, at least in my case, there's an Italian proverb which is untranslatable into English, which says, non tutto il mal viene per nocere. That's it, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much. And I am remiss for not mentioning at the outset that um, Dr. Andrew Viterbi is the author of a book entitled Reflections of an Educator, Researcher, and Entrepreneur, um, published um, by Central Prima Levi, which um, goes into more detail on his immigrant childhood, childhood and his success as a scientist and businessman, and um, I think also the principles that have guided your life. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, there has been so much offered here that is um, rich for conversation and one scarcely knows where to begin. But it seems to me that nearly all of you touched upon um, legacies in the present, uh, memories in the present. And it seems very timely to ask um, whether historians of Italian fascism and historians of Italian Jewish uh, culture must change their sense of the timeline of fascist history in light of the present moment. Um, not only the, the rise of, um, of a, whether we call it a neo-fascist, a post-fascist or a fascist government and, uh, and prime minister that uh, accrued 26% of the popular vote. Um, so I wonder if we might start there whether the present moment 
changes the way the field will teach the past, imagine the past, or perhaps in the future, rewrite that past. Um, and the floor can, can be open, um, Shira Klein, because you have to leave, or Andrew Viterbi, because I know you have to leave, you're welcome to go first, but the floor is open. Um, I just want to throw out a quick thing. I think the takeaway is for the field that we have to continue to ask ourselves, what is the appeal of authoritarianism and fascism? That's the, the contemporary lesson. This is still drawing people in. There, there is something to this politics that continues to be really powerful and attractive to far too many people. Julia. I, I would like to say that, that uh, uh, I think that the actual situation uh, changed the ways in which uh, uh, different generations of historians look at uh, the development and the history of Italian fascism. And in this regard, I, I, I I, I can think of the fact that when I started to study Italian fascism, uh, it was a diff very different context from now. And I really didn't uh, think of studying fascism as something which, uh, I mean, in a way, uh, uh, was was uh, was to be was was in in my present, and I didn't think that uh, the threat to democracy in the nineties, where when I started to um, to study fascism, were the same or comparable to those that we are we are seeing today and 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 in some way this 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 is changing deeply the the, the, the questions that I asked to my to the past <laughs> and not only to the present and uh, and uh, if if I mean, if I were, if I was not the testimony and uh, and worried about the changing of our time, uh, it's also a very uh, fertile, I would say, moment in which to think to uh, uh, what Marla Stone uh, so said uh, some minutes ago. Uh, so the, the 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 desire and the appeal of authoritarianism and uh, and um, of authoritarianism, I would say, uh, in the present. Uh, this said. It is also a, way, a moment in which uh, I think our uh, perception and our capacity to uh, uh, read asynchronies, uh, differences, differences in context, uh, uh, differences in 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 in, uh, in the ways in which. Uh, different context changes uh, the, the reaction of people uh, can can express it uh, it at uh, its, its maximum level and uh, and uh, uh, helping us to understand the deep uh, uh, role of historians which is at the same time to make uh, questions that uh, are appealing for the present but also to avoid uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, anachronism <laughs> in, in different uh, in different direction. Um, something else that I would like to say is that for me, one of the issues that uh, that are relevant and that, that are in a way uh, uh, provoking uh, new thoughts uh, of the present is there um, is that uh, we I, I think historiography and Italian historiography in general, but also European historiography did not address much the issue of the relationship existing between fascism and neo-fascism, especially in the immediate uh, post-45 period. And I think that uh, uh, this issue would be uh, central in order to understand better uh, the differences and uh, the, uh, um, the continuity and also the difference between the, our past and our present. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> I... I had to, I had to think a bit about this one, and I and I love Julia and Marla's comments. And I what came to mind it, to me when you asked this question was <clears throat> how the term fascism is often harnessed by um, like opposing groups um, to 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 um, to sort of attack one another. And I'm thinking, for instance, of Israel right now, which is very much in the news and how um, 
I mean, fascism in Israel is a very weighty word, right? It sort of brings up these connotations of World War II, of persecution, of the Holocaust, of strong ties to Nazism. Um, and so I think that is very much used in Israel as a kind of um, catch-all phrase to, 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 um, to, to, to signify the threat um, under which Jews uh, feel, feel that they exist. But then, of course, the other thing that you see happening in Israel now is um, a, a weakening, if not dismantling, of, of the judicial system, um, dismantling of checks and balances, and really this consolidation of power by, by the executive, um, which, which is very much, all, all these things are very much uh, sort of markers of fascism. Um, and so um, that to me seems like this interesting um, contradiction and yeah, very worrying. And, and I agree with Marla, it's sort of, the, the, this, this, this is all too attractive, um, these, these features of fascism. Um, yeah. Thank you, Corey, please. Yeah, um, I, 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 I found, well, the, the, the final, uh, I agree with, with a lot of things, that, almost all things that have been said, but I found the final remark by Julia uh, particularly pertinent. Uh, we, we had this curious coincidence on the 100th anniversary of the March on Rome, uh, post-fascist, I would use the word post-fascist, uh, prime minister took office uh, in Italy. It wasn't exactly the same date. It was uh, one week, uh, October 22 and October 28, of course, is the anniversary. But the, the, the coincidence was very, very strong and attracted the, the, the media. And uh, now, I think that when, if we want to understand what happened in Italy specifically, but in general, uh, we we have to start studying post uh, uh, neo fascism seriously. And the history of neo fascism is not mere; is something very different from the history of fascism. Um, yes, there were at the beginning the same people that were nostalgics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but those movements and groups and people mingled with other ideologies and groups and interacted inside democratic regimes for decades within parliaments, within local institutions, sometimes challenging democracy, sometimes representing a serious threat. And it has various dramatic examples of this. But what, I'm, what I want to say is that uh, the, the history of, of neo-fascism through the post-war is, is so rich and complex that it deserves a specific attention and has to, it is important, I think, uh, to, to consider it as something that, that needs to be studied in and of itself. Um, and when often journalists, because of the uh, anniversary and so on, think about the connection with fascism, I think that the right answer from a historian should be, no, look at the history of neo-fascism and what happened afterwards. And, uh, there is one key issue uh, that I know Julia cares very much about uh, in defining fascism, which is violence. Uh, and I think that the moment that we look current politics in Europe and the threats to democracy elsewhere, we don't find anything comparable to the level of violence of the early um, years after World War I. The habit of conceiving the enemy, uh, the adverse political adversary, something, someone you would kill, uh, and the, the knowledge of the techniques to do that um, effectively. Uh, I mean, the, the, the issue of violence is a, is a central issue, which I think should suggest that, the, it, among other things, that maybe the category of fascism is, is now the key one to understand uh, the challenges towards democracy today. And I'm not saying that there are no challenges. There are many, uh, but, but I think they come from, from other uh, dynamics and they have a lot to do with communication and the media system and the way it, in which it was transformed, social media. And so so a, a series of things that are uh, untranslatable to the early 20th century context. Um, and, and I think it's it's really really important for 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 us as historians to uh, distinguish and and make uh, and point out differences uh, in context. 
uh, I personally am, am very, very much uh, uneasy when, when the category of fascism is used today. I would use other uh, categories to, to describe the current political uh, climate in Italy, in Europe, and, and abroad. Well, that actually brings me to, to another question I wanted to pose, um, which is whether um, the, a focus on the anniversary of fascism, fascism is not either overblown or a distraction from, where as you're describing, longer, deeper rooted historical trends and to the ubiquity of violence as, um, as, a, as a marker of 20th century European well, as well as 19th century and beyond, but um, an Italian history. So um, I would be interested to have, since all of you are engaging themes of violence in, in your work, to have you meditate on how that concept has evolved for Italian historians and um, maybe including Italian's history of, um, excuse me. Can I say something? Um, uh, I have the impression that uh, uh, the focus on the anniversary uh, came uh, timely in a way, uh, not just because it permitted us to, um, to consider, uh, even in critical ways, uh, the differences and distances of the present with the past, but also because uh, it uh, bring, brought at, us back uh, to uh, a recognition of a general history of fascism, which is not limited to the Russian laws or, uh, to the, uh, or to the development of deportation and the Second World War. Because when uh, we, uh, in a way, have to think to this anniversary, we have to recognize that the violence existed well before the Russian laws. Uh, we have to recognize that this violence was one of the elements of uh, the seizure of power of Italian fascism. And we are also to recognize something that is not very much recognized in international uh, historiography, the fact that Italian fascism was invented in Italy and that was a, a part of, uh, and from Italy in a way, uh, uh, traveled uh, in other countries. And I think that the, the, the trend that started in the 90s of transnational and comparative history of fascism, which was and is very important in uh, changing and, and development historiography on fascism, in a way put into uh, uh, or uh, limited or uh, in a way addressed uh, less than it should have been uh, the role of uh, the Italian fascism in the 20s in changing the uh, political uh, uh, situation in Europe. Not much because it has it had an actual role, but especially because it showed uh, that a fascist model was uh, answering to issues that were uh, asked in other country and in different way, but to which Mussolini and his men uh, in a way build uh, an answer. Uh, in this way, I think that uh, the recognition of the role of, and of the importance of Italian fascism for Italian historiography, but also for international historiography is crucial. Also in thinking the role that, of, that other authoritarian countries and other authoritarian leaders can have in the present with regard to other uh, experience uh, in, in Europe and abroad. Yeah. Gori, I, I, I just want to jump in and disagree a little bit uh, with Gori and, and maybe say a little bit to what Julia just said. I think that looking at neo-fascism is absolutely useful, but looking at the original fascism, and as Julia just said, the first fascism, right? Fascism is the new ideology of the 20th century, and it was invented in Italy, and it was invented by the fascists uh, in 1919. Um, so we can't understand the neo-fascism without the original fascism. And then in terms of the current global authoritarianism not being violent, I, I completely disagree that these movements are all backed up by violence. We've got January 6th, we've got April 6th, and all of those movements use the symbols and signs of original fascism, not neo-fascism. You know, the guy wearing the Camp Auschwitz shirt on January 6th was referring to Nazism, not to 
neo-Nazism. So I, I think that's, or even to think about Be, uh, Steve Bannon's attraction to Julius Evola. Uh, so the core of original fascism, I think, is, is still really central. Um, and then, yeah, I just want to agree with what Julia said, that we that the there's been a little bit of a downplaying of the contribution made by the, the origins in the first place to sort of idealize and put into practice this ideology. Corey, do you want to respond? Yes, very, very quickly. Now, I totally agree that, the, of course, it is important to, to consider uh, the, the, the starting point, the, the origins and the cultural matrix and so on and so forth. Um, at the same time, the history of neo-fascism is much longer than the history of fascism. Um, and through that time, uh, it, it was not just a mere conservation of symbols and rhetorics. It was a transformation. Giorgia Meloni, since we started from the, the, the anniversary and the new political context, so the new president of the Italian Council of Ministers, is 46 years old. Um, she comes from a political and cultural context which has some memory of some fascist keywords and at the same time her cultural references her personal experiences are well basically informed by the 80s and 90s that's the context in which she politically grew up uh, just to personalize but to, since we're, we were talking about the coincidence with the with the anniversary and if, if you look at the movement in which she, she developed politically in, in that period, yes, there was a nostalgia. Yes, there was people doing the fascist salute and so on and so forth. But it was something different also. The, 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 the whole new fascist movement is complex and its history is, is, is long and through time it, it evolved. I'm not in any way saying that the roots are, are not there. There are. But, but at the same time, the experiences are different. And when I, when I talked about violence, I mean, well, I think we must make two distinctions. One, European perception of violence is much different from American experience of violence. Um, Italy has basically not been in war since 1945. The US has been constantly in, in war, uh, basically uh, in very, very different conflicts and so on and so forth. But also at an internal level, internal domestic violence is, is much, much different. So I, I was basically re referencing the, the European context. And if we look at the experience of violence for, I mean, my generation, and uh, which coincides by, by, uh, by incident with, with that of the current Italian president of the Council of Ministers, this is not a generation that has, among its founding experiences, um, violence at its, uh, at its core, uh, political violence at its core in, in any way, uh, nor, nor do you see that in France or Germany. Uh, and without political violence, what is fascism? And the second part is, the, the other key element of fascism is a polygenetic ideology. There is Currently, I don't see any such polygenetic aim. Um, uh, I, I see criticism of, of the current system, but no, no project, no explicit theorization of a radical transformation of society. Uh, so in that way, I, I, I don't see, uh, I see very, very difficult the, the connection with historic fascism. I, I see something different, conservative, uh, radically conservative cultural and political movements, which developed through inside democracy through time. Uh, Yuri, we, we, you don't want to forget about the Ani di Piombo when you talk about political violence. You know, how old was Maloney? Mm -hmm. when, you know, that she, was she, she was she well in the Ani di Piombo. She was she's a bit younger than me, so okay. she has no 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 experience of that. But she there's was, not a distant memory of political violence. It wasn't that long ago. But but it was I mean even compared if you look at the numbers uh, of, of uh, I mean of the the violence in the seventies in Italy was rough compared to any other European country more extreme but still if you look at compare it to what happened in Italy between nineteen fifteen and nineteen twenty two it's it's much much lower 
Um, so if I could redirect our attention, I, I would like to return to something, Julia, that you said in your presentation that I thought was extremely interesting. You, you spoke about how colonialism and Jewish history um, are analytic frames that are, are hinges in a way to, to, to allow historians to, to open up the broader question of, of what is Italianness, what is Italian, what is Italian citizenship. Um, and I think that's it's a it's such a useful formulation um, as a way of insisting upon the importance of um, neglected and minoritarian experiences. And, and I, I see this historiographic trend, of course, reflected across uh, studies of, of, of Europe um, and of other contexts. So I wondered if others wanted to respond to this um, to this to this framework of Julia's or Julia, if you wish to expand upon um, uh, reframing the central question of how we understand the um, typology, the timeline, the essence, the um, the stuff of Italian history, and how these um, these fields, once regarded as perhaps marginal, too, have become inextricable from that from the central thrust of Italian history. And um, Julia, you might you might wish to start and tell me if I've misrepresented your words. No, I think that the, I mean, I really think what I said, uh, the fact that uh, true uh, various different practices and uh, ideas, uh, fascism tried to change uh, or to uh, transform Italy and Italians in a direction that was not completely different from what Italian were, but which uh, pushed the limits and the boundaries of what Italianness or how Italianness should be considered since 22. Uh, and uh, and I think that uh, this worked through violence, for example, against anti-fascism, but also through laws. Uh, we cannot uh, uh, forget the fact that uh, in 26, uh, uh, Italian government said that uh, all uh, uh, Italian exiled uh, could uh, to to all Italian exile could be the Italian citizenship could be removed in case they were speaking badly of their government or uh, other I mean aspects of this kind. But since 1922, there was a progressive exclusion of uh, uh, anti-fascists first and the marginalization of uh, the Italians who weren't Catholic or weren't speaking Italians, for example, at the border, I, I think of uh, 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 Italian with German uh, culture and language and, uh, and Slovenians, etc. And this I mean, continuous transformation of what, which was at the same time cultural, but not just cultural, because it was enforced through, through also legislative aspect, uh, in a way forged uh, progressively uh, other ideas of, of what an Italian was. And, uh, and I think that the Russian laws were although different, a uh, part of uh, a, a, a design of transformation of what the Italians were and what should, they should have been, but also that they, they were I mean, also the beginning of a new, of a new uh, uh, attempt to transform even more what Italianness was, for example, by saying that every Italian uh, was to marry an, a foreigner uh, uh, should have uh, asked for authorization uh, from the home ministry. So, and I think that this brings us back to contemporaneity because I think that uh, in a way, uh, um, I mean, I, I agree with Guri that there are many differences, uh, but I wouldn't personalize uh, this aspect because uh, Meloni is not alone. There is a political movement which is uh, uh, also different and in which in which participation also to violent episodes, et cetera, is not completely foreign. And and on, on the other hand, I, I would say, and, and the context Context is really different, and Italian are <laughs> really different. Uh, uh, although this is a more general uh, uh, transformation of uh, uh, Western politics, and uh, um, uh, and I think that uh, the the 
uh, I mean, the mobility of uh, ideas and practices from one continent to the other, from the past and from the present should be in a way disentangled in a more uh, uh, attentive way, eh? not only uh, with regard with the present, but also with regard uh, uh, to the past. But I would also say that uh, there, there, I, I, I can see some um, forms of continuity more in the culture and in the way in which which tradition is considered than in uh, the actual practices. And, and I also see a, an attempt to transform uh, the limits and the boundaries of the Ita Italian democracy by changing deeply uh, our constitution with, with a project which is already there, uh, which uh, is clearly uh, not exactly the constitution of something that we have seen in the past, but that brings us into a different model of democracy. Uh, so I'm Thank you. It's just so fascinating. We we have uh, less than three minutes left on our clock, but I want to give um, Guri and then perhaps the final word to Marla to respond to those comments or, or any any last thoughts. But I feel we only have a minute and a half or so each. But I, uh, Guri, if you'd like to go first, and Marla. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I. Um... I just wanted to pick up on something that, uh, that I think was key that Julia mentioned um, uh, um, in, in her first uh, uh, um, uh, speech. Uh, when, when she pointed out the, the roots of racial uh, politics, both colonial racism and anti-Semitic racism, and if I, if I remember correctly, um, what you said was, well, it goes back at least to the 1920s or, or something like that. Um, and uh, I totally agree. And at the same time, I, uh, I, 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 I and well, others would, would push it back much more. I from this point of view, I, I think you, you were right to point out the, the issue of what you conceive as, as an Italian, as a, so the issue of citizenship and identity, and nationalism, and so on and so forth. And from this point of view, I think that uh, it, it is important to recognize that, well, from, for me, but maybe not only for me, one of the most important contributions to historiography on contemporary Italy uh, in the last decades was Alberto Banti's book on the nation of the Risorgimento and his radical reframing of um, the matrix of Italian national discourse. What Alberto, among other things, pointed out in a book that was translated um, in English, uh, well, the book came out in 2000 in Italian and in English, I think, a couple of years ago. Um, was that the imagery connected to blood. Uh, so the idea of the nation as a, com a community of blood was, was present since, since uh, the, very, the very origins of Italian national discourse. Uh, well, forgive me, Guri, for interrupting you. I, there, there's so much yeah, more to say, but in, in deference to our time, I want to let Marla have, right. a, have a final thought or response. Yeah, I, I think this has been a really productive conversation, and I think it's really a sign of where we are, the fact that we, you know, the title is New Approach to the Study of Italian Fascism and Italian Jewish History, but what is behind everything is the power of the present, right, that, you know, it's on all of our minds, and that studying fascism, studying the 20s and 30s and 40s has now become having to deal with the present and think about these connections. Absolutely, it's, you know, it's something we're all dealing with. Um, and really, as I, you know, as I said, the how the politics of fear and exclusion and nationalism can be very powerful and intoxicating and that you throw that into a period of social, political and economic crisis and it can be a perfect storm uh, that makes democracy look like a failure. And I just want to sort of conclude with maybe a thought about, you know, Guri saying that, well, we, we can't really compare the present far right movements or fascist inspired movements with the original ones because there's no palingenesis. And that's a reference to Roger Griffin's idea that fascism uh, was promising a rebirth, a recreation of the nation and the individual. Well, certainly when we think about the American far right, there is a kind of, 
absolute transformation that is wanted by the extreme far right. You know, they call it people studying it, the great replacement theory. They want to recreate American society. Uh, so I, you know, I think that, that, I think the comparisons are apt. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to offer my, my warmest thanks to the Levy Center staff, to Julia, to Marla, to Gori, to Shira, to Andrew Futurbi for his personal remarks, his support um, for this and so many other programs through our center. We appreciate you joining us and we invite you to follow our events in person and online. Many, many thanks to our speakers.